Caros participantes, bom dia. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming back here on the second day of the seminar. Thank you for being here so early. So today, the most important topic here today are going to be uh, related to the processing of natural languages. We're going to have the first panel. It's going to be uh, the moderator is going to be Mr. Tiago Marzagão, and we are going to have the. Uh, I'm going to tell you how the Q&A is going to happen. We have a channel on Twitter, and so you're going to need to have a, a, an account on Twitter, and then you can use the hashtag Brazil, uh, Brazil Digital, and so any comment that you publish is going to be uh, seen by us, and we are monitoring the questions, and the moderator is going to share this with the speakers. And so we are going to have uh, an igual a, a egalitarian access to the questions. So I'm going to pass the floor to the moderator, Mr. Tiago Mazargão, so that he can start the first panel of the second day of the seminar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our first presentation is going to be application of text mining and machine learning as a mechanism for evaluating actions and public policies in social networks. And I would like to invite Katia Kelvis Cassiano and Mr. Douglas Farias Cordeiro from the Federal University of Goiás to take their uh, places here on the stage with me. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Professor Katja Kelvis. I work at the Federal University of Goiás, the UFG. I work with the uh, management of information uh, at the Communication College. And jointly with Mr. Cordeiro, I'm part of the GTA, which is the work group related to communication, information. And so here is our contact. If you are interested in creating a partnership, it's a great honor to be here. And so last year, we also presented a paper and I, have a, I would like to thank the organizers of the event because they gave us this opportunity. So I'm going to present the work developed by the two of us. Okay, so uh, text mining and machine learning applied to the evaluation of public policy. So we created a solution as a mechanism to assess all of the actions and public policies via the monitoring of social network, of social media. This is a general view of our motivation. There is a great need to assess the results of public uh, policies in our society, and this need cooperates to the growth, to the growth. And so, we live in a, a data ecosystem. We have millions and millions of data produced simultaneously in a second, and we have the need to generate knowledge that is going to uh, support the decision-making process. And so this is the greatest motivation that we have so that we can do the data treatment. And we have this need to use this kind of data so that we can assess public policies. Jointly with this demand, we also have a need to innovate and also to automatize the decision-making processes. And, and the approach that we decided to use was the interaction between the people via social media so that we could produce this kind of knowledge. So our main objective here is to use machine learning and data uh, and text mining so that we could develop a monitoring, a continuous monitoring tool that after this monitoring, 
we could have the identification and the definition of indexes so that we can assess public policies. Well, public policies. Public policies can be defined as a set of actions uh, started by the government, and I'm talking about the government at the municipal, state, and federal levels, and that the main objective is to uh, to reach uh, several sectors of our society. And when we talk about reaching sectors of our society, we have the, the following problem. We have to assess how these actions are being noticed by, uh, and that's where we are motivation. That's where our motivation comes from. We need to assess uh, how the, the our society sees the public policies when they are implemented of any public policy. And among all of this data, we have social media. So social media, they interact, they interact with one another, and they interact with the state. And so why not use these channels, these communication channels, so that we can notice this feeling of how the public policies are being uh, observed and seen by our citizens. So I have a panorama here, one minute on the web, how much data is produced, how many data are produced. So 188 million emails are sent, Snapchat, they share, they share thousands and thousands of photos and so on and so forth. And so the amount of data uh, grows exponentially, and these data, and so they, they upload relevant information that we can explore and generate knowledge, create knowledge that are going to support the decision-making process and the strategic decision-making process. So our solution is based on the KDD. KDD defends what? Discovering knowledge in large databases. So this methodology, even though it seems very linear, the f the phases they can be uh, implemented in an interactive way so nothing is going to hinder us from whenever we are uh, doing data mining that we're going to have more data for the analysis and then you can go back and collect more data so it defends some uh some phases and in our solution we use web scrap so that we could get data from social media and after these data that we collected we selected most of the data that were important for us to analyze some criteria that I'm going to mention later on and so the data since the data are not structured and they are they have their own characteristics they are data that have a certain amount of characters special characters they can come mixed up you can have text videos images and so the 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 data must be pre-processed and transformed into a format that is compatible with the language the machine language so after they are transformed, we're going to have the nucleus of our solution, which is mining these data. And what is that? That is we are tr going to try to extract patterns that can try to explain these data. And after these patterns, we are going to generate knowledge, information, relevant information that can be interpreted. And we're going to need uh, expert knowledge so that we can interpret the information. 
and after that create knowledge. When we are mining the data, we use two techniques and it's going to become clearer to you in the following slides. And so we had an analysis of the feelings, so we developed a classifier of these feelings and a natural language processing tool so that we could do the clustering of the data and also generate information. So, natural language processing is one of the techniques that we used so that we could do the clustering of the data. And so natural language processing is a set of artificial intelligence techniques. And so we go back to the concepts and the principles of uh, AI. And the main objective is to process and analyze large volumes of uh, text data in natural languages. And so via these techniques, we are able to supply and provide provide human-machine interactions. The interpretation of sentences, of documents, of text documents, it involves some analysis techniques that are a little different from the data, from the structural data that we are used to dealing with. When we talk about text data, it's very important to know not only the morphology, that is, how the words were created, how the words were formed, and then we go back to the phonemes, to syntax analysis, the grammar of each language. But another important aspect of this uh, processing of text data is also the semantics, because via the semantics, we are going to be able to define the meaning of the text. And when we talk about meaning of the text, something that you have to consider is the context. The meaning depends on the context in which the text is inserted. And we have a big challenge ahead of us when we talk about Portuguese, Portuguese, because we are dealing with natural language and in Portuguese, which is a poly, pol, polysemy, polysemy. We have many terms that can mean different things. They can have different meanings depending on the context. So we're going to get the same word, the same morphology, the same grammatical rule. However, it's going to have a different meaning according to the layout in the text, its placement in the text, and according to the context. So this is one of the biggest challenges that we have when it comes to natural language processing. And we need to carry out the semantic analysis, the frequency of the same terms in the same sentence or in the same paragraph, but above all, the context in which the terms are inserted. So the technique that we used, and so we use the doc2vec. This is the tool that we had used which is a non-supervised learning tool that deals with the terms. And when I say the word terms, you can understand words, words in a sentence. These terms represent these words in a vectorial space. So each term is represented by a vector. And whenever there is a sentence, bear in mind that this methodology can so it can be a sentence, it can be a paragraph, it can be an entire document, it can be a summary of a document. And so after each one of the terms is represented by a vector, a paragraph is also going to be represented because we are concatenating the terms that form this paragraph. And here we have an illustration of how the algorithm works when it comes to the training. So the non-supervised training. And then we have each term is represented by a vector. And the training is predicting 
the likelihood of this term happening again in the sentence. And so we have the cat sits. And so this is predicting the presence of the word on. And after this concatenation, all of the terms that create a paragraph or a sentence, they're going to be represented by a vector. And so if I have a set of paragraphs or if I have a set of textual documents, each document, each paragraph is going to be represented in a vectorial space. The distance between these vectors is going to give you an idea of similarity of the documents. And then we have the semantic aspects that our technique proposes. So the closer the vectors are, they are within the same context. Vectors that are farther away, they discuss different topics. This is the main idea. Sentiment analysis or feeling analysis. This is a, a classification methodology. And this is a supervised machine learning in which it classifies the text according to the po polarity of feeling. So we have positive, neutral, and negative. And our solution used naive base algorithm. And I have an example to show you how it works. It calculates the likelihood a posteriori given an initial probability of that class. And so let's imagine that we want to diagnose a certain disease. And then we test one we tested one hundred individuals. So among these 100 individuals, we came to the conclusion that 20 individuals, they have the disease, and 80 individuals are healthy. Among these individuals that have the disease, 90% received a positive result. And so they were sick, and then when we gave them the test, 90% uh, appeared as truly being sick. And 30% of the individuals that did not have the disease also received a positive result. So the question is, if a new individual is tested and given a, posit a positive result using this uh, model, how likely is this individual to have the disease? And so just to illustrate, among the individuals, we have two possibilities. Um, so have that disease or healthy, and the, the results of the test. So via this technique, the probability, the conditional probability of being positive or receiving a positive result, given that the person truly has that disease, is given by this formula that considers the probability of having the disease because the test was positive, the probability of having the disease divided by the probability of having the disease and having received a positive result. And so this is calculated by the database. And after the algorithm, we calculate the a posteriori probability. So once the test was positive, there is a probability of 42% of the person having the disease. And then we also calculate the probability of denial. Given that the result was positive, there is the probability of 57% of the person being healthy. Well, using these two techniques, we uh, have proposed a methodology, and we use tweets published between July of 2018 and June of 2019 containing the hashtag corruption, just to show uh, how the solution was going to work once it was implemented. And so the data was extracted using web scrapping, as I talked about during the ar architecture of the solution. We removed and deleted stop words, special characters that are not relevant. They were stored in CSV format, 
and the text was tokenized. So there was tokenization of the text in terms of words. And so the two algorithms used were Doc2Vec and Naive Base. So the goals were to explore the similarity between the tweets. For visualization, similarity graphs were generated. And each node has a weight that is re uh, that refers to the sum of the similarity values among the tweets. So within the vectorial space, we have the distance between one vector to the other. And this represents each tweet. And the node size is related to the representativeness of the tweet in that textual corpus. And so you can see this. It's well defined. You can see three groups of tweets talking about three different uh, contexts uh, discussing the hashtag corruption. And here we have the highest frequency terms. We have uh, demonstration, protesting, car wash operation, money laundering, and other terms that are not uh, highly co uh, correlated to the other two groups. And then you have soccer, soccer cup. And so the feeling analysis or the sentiment analysis, there are some slices from the tweets and how they were classified by our solution. So we love Brazil, we love the family, and we treat criminals as criminals, and we do not get involved in corruption schemes. And so this is, was a positive feeling. And so here, how frequent the, the tweets were when they had the hashtag corruption. So this is a general overview. But you can uh, drill down and do a deeper analysis. And here there is a negative uh, sentiment. And so in October of 2018, we had almost the triple of negative tw uh, tweets in October of 2018. And so what are going to be our next texts? We're, we intend to validate these results and to use a hybrid analysis with the results of the clustering that, were, uh, that was given to us via the natural language processing. Use these results as input to create classification uh, techniques. Apply content analysis techniques. Create a dynamic dashboard solution. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'm totally open to your questions and doubts that you may have. Thank you very much. And thank you to the organizers of, of the event for this wonderful opportunity. I have a short announcement to make, and it's a little funny too. Here, there are some people that are by mistake. They went to the mining uh, event from real mining, and then they came to the uh, data mining uh, event. So you're in the wrong room. Go to lab two, laboratory two, uh, in your to your workshop. Okay, this is this. So another announcement, how far you, you came here by Uber, so we left your keys at the, the Uber driver car. <laughs> the next presentation is cut up. Classificators of PDF document and special accounts. So we'll call Marcos Borella from the Federal Court of Accounts. He's talking about documents classifier in the system for management of special rendering of accounts.
Okay, I will turn on the chronometer. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to share with you three secrets. The first one is CADOP is my first pro CLADOP is my first pro project in data analysis. So please, but don't feel uh, disappointed. Okay, it is actually a motivator. Even after the 50, after you turn 50, you can start. Another secret is it is the first time that I speak to a large uh, uh, audience with hundreds of people. And the third and last secret, the first time that I speak with simultaneous interpre interpretation in English and Spanish, uh, Brazilian la uh, sign language. So I'm, I'm not saying that to justify my, my mistakes. I don't have control for them, but ju justify my shaking. Uh, well, the shaking is, is just a joke, but thank, thanks to God, the secrets are true. So, talking about CLADOP, I started on this area last year, and the Federal Court of Accounts have a strategy of strengthening the knowledge for da data analysis. And then they promote this uh, workshop, This, I mean this training course for the employees and then I I did this course in August last year and I I did my um, final test uh, last month and since last year I started to apply in CloudUp the techniques that I used in the course I was it was it started from scratch and it evolved the same way as I evolved in the area so just to give you a notion, the first version of the classifier had the accuracy of 77% considering the data tests and the separation was not very safe and the, the latest version has 91.3 with standard deviation of 0 0.3 with uh, test separation, with cross validation, monitor, monitor, monitoring and updating of data. So as I started learning uh, how to do it, I moved my knowledge to the classifier, which was going to be my con course conclusion text. And I will present this uh, this uh, conclusion course this afternoon. The classifier as a product, it automatically classifies documents in PDF format which are inserted in the system of management of special accounts, rendering of special accounts of t uh, the Federal Court of Accounts. CLADOP also is the project, the process of development and I will talk about it as well. These, this is the presentation plan. Uh, just we know, we all know that uh, these techniques are invading our lives, as uh, in our personal lives or as institutions. In in in, in TCU, we have the chatbot that uses Zillow, that uses uh, learning mach uh, machine learning. Uh, the recognition of identity, and when you when you enter Netflix, there are uh, movie suggestions to you. So in this context, CLADOP is just a small contribution for greater efficacy or effectiveness of the management of special accounts. It is an interesting of it is, it is interesting for all Brazilian citizens because it contributes to the quality of data and it improves the usability the um, time of response, the user will not spend a long time choosing a type of pro a process. It just brings it, the, the suggestion to you. And just to contextualize, I will not go into detail regarding the techniques because I don't have enough time. And it was great for the professor to present some things here before me. She introduced some topics. CADOP is contextualized there. It is data analysis that, uh, that that is developed by existing data of 
document classification. It is machine learning. I had a learning uh, a learning process in a uh, neuro a neuro um, network. It is also AI, and also it it, ha it is a natural language processing because it works with the text. So in the context of uh, this thing, and unfortunately it happens not only in Brazil, all over the world, we bring some losses to the public revenues. Because if there is a payment in for the min Ministry of um, Health to buy 15 ambulances and you, buy and you only buy 10, so you open investigation in the public administration also in their culture you sponsor a concert and it, the concert doesn't occur it generates debit and and the whole uh, public administration is the user of TCA system uh, it is a platform that is the, uh, solely used for all the the public um, administration and it contextualized the publication so TCA it is a special account uh, a tool for the process of recuperating the, the money for the public uh, safe and the ETCE you have s determined that the documents are inserted in a PDF format and, and it's uh, available. But it's known that although PDF in the literature is a format used in uh, law courts all over the world, you have problems in the quality of the content. This author, he, he comments that the documents do not preserve the sequence of the words. So the graph, this graphic that you see here demonstrates this in this quadrant are documents that have many pages and many words, many valid words per page. Now let's go into the product. Uh, I will show you Cladop really quickly to you. This is the screen of the, of the ETC, ETC system and I'm not part of the team that developed it but I just made the classifier that this system uses, but other people created it. The users, they enter the um, losses, uh, the financial losses, and it selects the files that demonstrate that this loss uh, happened. The statements of uh, money transfer, it does the upload to the system, and then it clicks it selects the type, so they could over a list of 82 items, but they could make a mistake or choose one that is not really the type that he wants. But thanks to Cladop, the type that they want is brought to him, and they make it right, because there is one type of document that that they want. But if it's not the one, he even has, he or she has the option to go over the whole list. So you don't lose the time. The, uh, the public servant, civil servants, will not lose this time. Today, the system has the opening for other options where you can describe the text. The classifier is a REST service dev developed in Python. It receives the file and from the content of the file and the name of the of the file it returns not only the most probable type it returns in fact nine most probable types because the accuracy the micro accuracy is in, is increased from 91 to 99 percent if you consider the nine types so maybe an evolution of the system, the second screen will show the nine ones and then you gain time with it. And apart from that, it brings you quality indicators of the text of the OCR of that PDF. 
it is important because today the system has a criticism they don't accept some documents w with a certain number of valid, uh, valid uh, words but I know the classifier brings back to them a tool set that they can use in the pre-processing of the text I substitute for example the CPF document numbers by the date or the field d uh, date in my case it doesn't matter the date it is it is important to know that there is a date there there is a CPF document number and it brings a bigger accuracy to you and I return in the JSON the which is the format of the text the raw text the front hand for the screen of TC I also return these indicators how many valid words that are in the document how many CPF document numbers how many dates because the system can criticize a uh, certain type if there is a certain uh, CPF num uh, document number and it's important that the reach of the results uh, expected to TC will will bring a more efficacy of the document. Now going to the third part, let's talk about the pro project. It is a path that I, I, I went through during my specialization course. It was my experience laboratory. So as I had my homework, I would apply it in Cardop. So let's see it. Just to give you a, a, an idea of the data, this information is, I, I mentioned in, in my uh, conclusion uh, text. So they were implanted for all the agencies. We have 72, 82 types associated to 163,000, over 106,000 documents related to over 4,000 damages. This is the amount of documents and you can see there is a an unbalanced stratification. You have types with many documents and many types with dozens of documents. We chose to train the classifier to all types separating the, the other ones. Now, uh, talking about some details of the modeling. The test criteria, we consider the micro accuracy. In the multi-class classifier, in my case, we have uh, 72 classes. It is just like a uh, it determines, it's the, it has a recall, it determines the chance of making it right. In the type of test, I separated it as crossed validation. It's divided in seven parts. Test in one seventh. And I did it several uh, times, several repetitions. The accuracy reached in the latest uh, version built was 91.1 .1 with standard deviation of 0 0.3 with some experimentations. There is a partial vi uh, vision by type. These are the 10 first ones. The documents here, these metrics were uh, verified and they are 5% of the generation of the network, of the base of validation. Regarding the pre-processing of the text in the content, of the of the text since we since this is a topic of this panel we have different uh, phases first phase was to obtain the text of PDF file I I did it in OCR like in a scanning of of the the text using Tesseract with in over 50 percent of the times the accuracy of the model improved but it takes about five minutes uh, in average, depending on the time of the, the file to process. So for the, the user to do the upload uh, to 
do the upload of the document and wait five minutes it's a long time so we decided to have the text with PDF with the minimum level of uh, requirement of the system the system open a fun functionality that if the document does not satisfy the minimum criteria the user can do the OCR using Tesseract in the system and then do the upload. As I said, the text that comes in the PDF file is substituted. Some texts are substituted by the name of the class. CPF, document number, dates. In the latest version, we considered this and the criteria of valid words. How many valid words are there in a document? What is a valid word? So, I got it from the Wikipedia in Portuguese. There were many words in English, strange uh, words that are not in Portuguese. And I added some business uh, text, acronyms of uh, partnerships. And that's what I consider, of course, without the stop words, unnecessary words, connected words. If you're interested, this is my little neuro uh, network that today it implements the classifier it is a deep uh, neural uh, network which uh, it has more than one um, layer and it's sequential the technique for transforming the text into numbers the technique that I use I will make more comments about it in a little while Something that makes me a little concerned, and I think the majority of the people here share this feeling with me, is that these projects of machine learning, data analysis, they don't don't give you uh, ropes. You you go up the mountain, you reach your your goal, but you don't leave the rope for other people to do the same. There is no sharing of competences. CADOP uh, was the cradle of the methodology that I will present in this afternoon, which was my text for conclusion of, of my specialization course. And, and this is the idea that I defend, that I advocate, to leave these, this rope for the, the, the future uh, climbers. You have CADOP, the trace of what was done, it is open, it, it is public. Um, you have the registration of the training, you have the learning, and here are some examples of learning. For example, on the 10th of April this year, in multi class classification, these metrics are equivalent. I didn't know that, but I learned it. And also some actions that were carried out on the 25th of March. I included the name of the, the, the file as a variable for the model. And here, the record of the training, the experimentation with the data to generate a model. And here we have all of the concepts involved in blue, and in blue we have the parameters so that the model could be generated. In yellow, we have data regarding the context and the metrics that we found. So everything can be found in a single table. It's the CLADOP. And as you can see here, you can see month after month how the trainings changed. Remember that I started in November of last year, and I have just concluded it now, in July of 2019. In Y, you have the number of documents. So the greener it is, the more accurate it is. Even though I was able to find a really green accuracy, but here I already had green accuracies. And it's not so green, right? But uh, over here it is. And so these experiments, they considered only four kinds of documents, four types of documents. 
amounts of documents. They only consider the amount of documents of X number of valid words. And this was very, very restrictive. And so, but this was the option I made for my project, yes, to analyze all of the database. Here we have uh, the techniques being experimented, and there was a, sequ a sequ sequential uh, network, and I used the light GBM algorithm. And just discussing with you, I should have had this slide here, but the numbers here, the words are translated into numbers so that the network and the algorithm can understand. And I use a, a very old technique. I don't use embeddings. I don't use embeddings. And pre-trained embeddings, maybe they're going to improve. I'm going to try this out. But in this case, given the failures in the sequence of the words uh, using OCR, the most modern techniques that use uh, uh, recurrent uh, networks, maybe there won't be many differences here. And embeddings with the text, because the text don't have a logical se sequence. But maybe pre-trained embeddings, they are going to make all the difference. I'm going to uh, test this. So wrapping up. Cladop is very simple, but it's little support for a very large and important process to find the people liable, to make the bad uh, public managers pay for their mistakes, and so that we can recover the money lost by the public treasury. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. The next presentation is going to be optimization in the analysis and classification of the requirements of the National Treasur Treasury. Yes, Attorney General's Office, and our speaker is going to be Mr. Fabricio Dallapola. I work. Good morning. My name is Fabricio. I work at CERPRO. I work at the uh, Artificial Intelligence and Analytics Department, and I'm going to discuss with you a concept proof that we developed jointly with the PGFN, so that we could classify the requirements of the national. Uh, Treasury Prosecutor's Office. And so they are classified in many statuses, and this classification is very expensive for the prosecutors. They receive a lot of requests and petitions, and so my idea is to optimize this process. So here I have the business processes of all of the work that we did. So we have the a regularized system that receives all the petitions and requests. So the, the request is carried out by the taxpayer. And via the regularized system, they created this petition. And basically, it has a description, the reason why they, uh, this request is being made, and also many, many annex documents. And so basically, this is what happens in, within the uh, regularized system. Of course, these documents that are annexed, as we have heard many times, they have images, and they must be digitalized, and they must be understood, and it makes our work very difficult. And so after that, we do the analysis. Well, the prosecutor does the analysis, and after that, he's going to classify the petition as approved, not approved, partially approved, or uh, harmed. And this is the 
this is the business process that we have now and this is the learning process the machine learning process so basically we have all the data that are within the regularized system usually they come to us in the text format and they're also annex not all of them are text and so internally these annexes they have many images sometimes and after that I have the preparation and the processing of these data and as we are discussing uh, natural language processing NLP and so they have to go through an OCR, uh, OCR process so that I can find the text and find the the description of the petitions so that afterwards they can go through the the processing the training process of the the model so it's a training to classify the text and right after that i'm going to have this multi-label classification the, stat the status that it mentioned approved not approved partially approved and the harmed one and partially approved so these are the five labels. So the solution has three, pr uh, three processing phases, which are the pre-processing, the classification, and the validation. During the pre-processing phase, we apply many techniques of natural language processing of NLP, the tokenization, we remove the punctuation marks, we remove the stop words, we remove uh, special words, we do the stamming, we remove small words that make no sense for the learning, we limit the number of uh, words in some cases, and grams, and the TF-IDF technique. So we do this during the training so that we can improve the machine learning process. The class for the classification phase, we use deep learning, DNN with three layers and 52 new neurons. And of course, we change this. We change these parameters sometimes so that they can adjust to the learning. But basically, this is what we used for the training. And for the validation, we have the confusion matrices that they are very good to carry out any kind of validation. The precision, recall, and F1 score, accuracy, and also the analysis of some data examples after we do the, the predictions and forecasting. So it's important to compare the data to see if it's truly in accordance with what you're looking for, okay? Okay, so this concept phase uh, was subdivided into three phases. And so we changed the way the data were included to, into the learning. In the first phase, we worked with around 6,000 uh, petitions, mainly with the texts of these petitions. And so in the past, uh, in the uh, previously, I mentioned the text, the annexes, but in the first phase, we had only extracted the text of the petitions. And so we did the pre-processing, the classification, and the validation in the first phase. And then we went to the second phase. And at this moment, beside the text of the petitions, we also took into consideration the text regarding the reasons and the annexes. And so I added OCR here because all of the annexes, they had to go through an OCR tool. And so we considered the same uh, 6,286 petitions plus 8,368 annexed documents because I can have more than one document annexed, annexed to the same petition. If I'm not mistaken, you need to have an X amount of annexes per document. And so even though we, we had already developed the process, we had to make amendments, to make changes, mainly in the pre-processing, to take the other pieces of information into consideration, the ones we had not taken into consideration in phase one. 
In phase three, we consider the same text of the, the petitions, the reasons, the annexes, but the petitions now jumped to 31,485 petitions with almost 80,000 documents annexed to them. Now let's discuss the results. Regarding phase one, we only had 6,286 petitions and the uh, average accuracy of the model was about 87 percent the first time we ran the model and this cheered us up and made us very excited so we had uh, we had not considered many but the process was already 87 percent accurate and then we went to phase two in phase two uh, we were very disappointed among the 6,286 petitions, around 50% of them were doubles or had been doubled, had been doubled. And so this uh, duplication was not necessarily a mistake of the extraction process, but it was a normal behavior because the regularized system allows these uh, duplications that the taxpayers do. And so we had not considered this duplication because it would have biased the learning of the network. So we had to remove them. We removed the doubled uh, text. We submitted the text and also the annexes and the reasons. And the average accuracy of the model went down to 66%. And so we we didn't uh, want it to be much, much better than the first one, but it went down. But now phase three. Now we have more data and the accuracy is going to increase, right? And so we had the, the doubling of the documents and we removed them and the accuracy went down again. It went down to 44%. And then uh, from the first phase to the second phase, this made sense. But from the second phase to the third phase, this didn't make sense. And so, but here we wanted the accuracy to improve, but this did not happen. So we started thinking about some issues and we came to some conclusions some important conclusions that we noticed throughout the entire process of this POC. The first one was the doubling of the petitions. This is part of the business, so it's nothing that can be corrected when it comes to the extraction of data. It's not an error. And we also noticed that the inclusion of the annexes they were not interfering too much on the accuracy of the training. But during the trainings that we implemented, we carried out some tests with the annexes, with some, some uh, parameters were changed, and we arrived at this conclusion that it didn't make much difference. Another uh, aspect that interfered a lot in the training, in the results, was the lack of balancing in the amount of occurrences or class occurrences, and this damaged the learning model a little bit. Machine learning model, and so, uh, and so a high percentage of these documents were petitions that uh, were not approved. So 50% subdivided into the other labels. And this also caused the bias in the training. So the ideal is to have the balancing of all of the uh, occurrence, all of the class occurrences. And so we ended up carrying out another test using only two classes approved and the other classes and so this balance my my training well and it was almost perfect and this presented higher accuracy because it was not our objective only to work with only two classes but this was a test that we did and it truly presented 
a higher result, a better result. Another very important point, and it's a very important point, that we also discovered is that the data that were submitted to the training of the model, the description, the reason for the petitions and the annexes, they were not sufficient, not even for a human being to make a decision. So the prosecutors, only a few times, the prosecutor can make a decision based on the data that we were submitting to the network. And so for the human being to make a decision to approve the petition, not to approve the, the petition, or the other status, he's going to access other pieces of information. And so we didn't go into details at that time, but he, he surfs on other systems, he has access to other kinds of information, and so these subsidize the, the decision he makes to approve or not approve the, the petition. And so this is important. So we wanted the machine to learn with less information that is even less information than a human being needs. And so, this also gave us an idea, a bright idea at that moment. So, we have the next steps that we're going to take. So, the POC is an idea, we are testing the concept so that we can design a project for this solution. So, we need to enrich the data that is available, and this is extremely important. As I mentioned, the data that we were submitting to the network, they were not enough. So we need to enrich these data. We need to extract data from other systems. We need to investigate what is necessary so that the machine learning can improve, can be better, so that we can have better results, and more reliable results when it comes to the forecasting of these petitions. We must have combined solutions. The data that I mentioned to you, they can come from other systems. I don't know if they are going to be exclusively texts or maybe they can be discrete data that I have to work in a different way. And so maybe I'm going to have to need to combine artificial intelligence techniques or to implement uh, everything among other integrated systems. And so I'm going to have eventually an uh, artificial intelligence solution in the end that is not going to use other techniques. So maybe I can have combined solutions. Accessory solutions. The, these solutions, actually the word solution is more, is broader than only in AI technique or anything else. It is a solution that will solve the problem that exists today uh, in the the problem of requirement classification. So the accessory solutions, they come to support the classification, but not, will not resolve the, resolve the problem totally. For example, I have the person of a curator, and they will evaluate the results, where to consider, when to consider, when not to consider. And then another point that was mentioned even by the National Treasury Attorney's General Office is an anti-spam um, filter. I'm talking about the emails to separate something that uh, you identify clearly that is not approved. That uh, a huge amount of not approved, non-approved requirements uh, in comparison to the other status, it's normal to happen. Many requirements, they arrive to the Attorney General's office and they are uh, immediately identified as uh, not approved. So the status that we define can be interesting for the anti-spam. I could have a better accuracy to the point of trusting that that degree of 
confidence in a classification of a document that is not approved, I can trust to send it to this anti-spam filter and accept it as not approved and work on the other statues that are not in this classification. Okay? So these are the three points that we assess, that we, we evaluate as a subsequent work, all right? Here I have the architecture and it's not definite yet. It is just a proposed uh, architecture and it happens if I have, if I basically have um, the requirements to be classified uh, solely. That's what we did in this POC. So basically here I have the curator before the pre-processing and the training of the network they will generate this model. This model executes the inf inference, the revision, and will feed the, pr the processing again and will generate logs for the audit and the statistics services. In this solution, I have the technologies, the ones that we used and the ones that we use in the concept proof and the ones that are going to be used in, the, in this architecture. And this is it. I would like to make it clear here, and I think it's important, the point of the solution. Not always we can have a solution that is 100% functional in terms of solving the problem 100% using only one technique or only by, by using uh, AI. I need to combine it with other things. and. Uh, what I understood here is this is the path we're going to take from now on. So we can have uh, a better resolution to the problems the best way possible. All right? And this is it. I thank you all for your attention and thank you so much. Wait, okay. Thank you, Fabrício. Now, I would like to call the other uh, speakers of this panel for I will start asking a question to Katia. Do you have any plan for expanding that in the future to public policies uh, for services of population, for example, to know what the, what the population think of the services of a hospital, of holes in the street, you know, things that are more concrete for the, 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 the agents to detect. For example, on Twitter, people are complaining there's a hole on, on the streets su such and such. Or do you want to keep it more in a more abstract level? What plans do you have to, in fact, make it operational and make it more uh, usable for public agencies? The idea is exactly this, what you're saying, to open it to other perceptions and not only regarding corruption, as it was shown here, but above all, to capture this perception of the user in different contexts and different sectors of society. This is exactly the idea, to share it, to keep it open to the different stakeholders. In the project that we, 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 we did with Katya, we had the idea of creating a system with a dashboard where the decision maker can define the topic they want to investigate and from this the system can uh, collect data and keep updating it. So it can be any point or problem, we can uh, gather this information. 
I have a question to Marcus. The recognition of identities that identifies documents and dates, was it used with neural uh, networks or regular expressions? Is it available for third parties? Yes. It was not this uh, entity recognition was made by regular expression. Dates, um, document numbers, the part of names. I have a little set of frequent names that are the most common ones. Now, regarding the question uh, asking if it's available, today FADOP is a code developed at the Federal Court of Accounts, but it's my interest to keep to have it available. There is a whole bureaucratic process to go through in order to have to make it available. A question to Fabricio. Were there tests for more complex um, models such as um, transformer or le learning transfer methods? Or did you think of less um, um, pro productivity? Well, in this moment, no. We didn't have a lot of time to test the techniques. So we used uh, the DNNs, which we had had in the past, uh, good results in the past. The removal of punctuation stop words, no, either. We kept this re uh, removal of, in all cases that we understood by the experience that it could generate better outcomes. Question to Katia. Concerning NLP and policy evaluation, I think the sentiment analysis must be supervised. How did you establish the training sample? This was one of the main problems that we had. We had a small sample with uh, about 1,000 tweets, but for this problem specifically, we captured tweets from t 2018 and 2019, so it brought about uh, 1 million tweets. We used a trained uh, database by Microsoft Azure as the training uh, base, and we used the one, another one we had for uh, making some uh, tests, and we, we reached the accuracy of around 91%, and from this we could obtain the result. But this is one of the main challenges for this problem. Thank you. Now I have one to Marcus. What is the role of the name of the file? Do you treat it differently? When we consider the name, the name of the file as a variable for the model, and there was an increase of accuracy of around 5%. Today, we use a separate bag for file names. You have a bag that is the set of frequent words, of the content, of the document, and another one for the name of file. Hmm. The latest version generated considers around 27,000 words in the bag. And I use the, the dimension reduction applying a truncated SVD technique, and it falls to 768 in a separate bag. I think it, this classification of increment was not clear. Was it used to automatize the decisions of approved and not approved? Yes, we don't really have this definition because at this moment we are just experimenting. It is a concept proof, as I told you. So the idea is to automatize it, but not necessarily um, approval or not approval 100%. The solution can be made and will be probably made of other techniques and other things that we can do uh, jointly. 
with the automation. The automation will probably happen, but not necessarily in a binary way, per se. It's like yes or no. It will happen in with a curing and revision, and depending on the degree of confidence that the provision will have. We will have a project, and as soon as we can plan it and design an architecture that is more complete, we will be able. We will have more certainty of what to do in that sense. Not to use the probability of belonging for each class, for example, prob probably uh, bigger than uh, 80 or 90 percent of belonging to that class, then the probability be being lower. You can add it to the circuit, such a like a like a, a select selection process. In the average accuracy of the model, 90 percent, you we have cases where you can define this class with 50% of certainty or 88% of certainty. So each provision has their own confidence level. I can have this margin, this limit of trusting 100% or not. We had some cases in which when there was a mistake, it, the mistake was really certain as well. So we need to be careful to create this limit, but be careful with cases in which this limit could be a safety uh, limit and it can generate problems. So it's possible to do it this way, but you need to have a, a confidence level that has to be improved. Right, let, me, let me bother with one more question. I remember a little while ago I saw in the attempt of, of automation, of correction, of writing of um, essays of school students and instead of the teacher reading the, that uh, essay uh, checking the, the grammar and spelling etc you have little algorithms that read uh, that um, that essay and gives a note about gives a grade in the criteria that the robot used was the use of uh, not very frequent words. There is a correlation. If the student is using uh, little frequently used words, it means that probably that student reads a lot and is likely to have uh, higher grades. The robot learned this and when they when it saw a kind of a rare word, it would raise the, the grade of that student. So you can, but you can cheat this system. If you write a, an essay that doesn't have a sentence uh, properly uh, sentence, properly written sentence, but only uh, text full of uh, uh, little frequently used words, you can have a good grade anyway. So have you have you seen in your project people ha doing the reverse engineering of what the algorithm is looking at, the, the, the criteria that has a big weight, bigger weight, and then you, you sit and you, and you think, and the person will sit and think, I will, I will write a, a requirement here for the system to read it and approve it because I, for example when I have the word CPTO and then I can have a, a bigger chance of approval or do you think I'm just tripping and it's not, it doesn't make any sense no no you're not tripping it really exists and it's quite new uh, in Brazil we don't hear a lot about it but I watched the lecture the other day uh, of a university professor of Canada and uh, saying that there are attacks of models of machine learning attacks regarding, regarding uh, images and audio. So they included um, noise in the images and in the audio. And this noise made the model to change the decision that it would make if the root was not included. For PLN, according to him, yes, there there is this probability but it's very little so the concern that you need to have is you if you have that for images and to audio certainly there will be something similar to PLN as well what is funny is that for images for example in the example that he, he gave the disturbance that was in the image was not perceptible at in the, for the naked eye for the human eye 
So we couldn't realize, we couldn't notice that the image was changed. So the noise was like a TV out of work, but it was an animal classificator, classifica classifier. So there was a panda. So they used the, 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 that noise there, and you didn't see the noise, and the classifier would get lost. It, it would classify it with, as, as another animal with a high degree of uh, confidence. So what, what, what was right in, in the, as 100 confidence with, um, without the, the noise, but with the noise it was 99%. So it was also um, read by, by the algorithm. So for PLN, we know there's, it's not uh, very common, but yes, it's possible. You can think of the issues of semantics, uh, the grammar by itself, that can be important in some projects and PLN trainings. A question to you two now. Yesterday we had presentations where people talk about uh, GCR, scan PDF with the brands of the companies, and you have the same problem. You have faced the same problem, so it's frustrating to see different agencies uh, facing this problem, many uh, hours, hours, salary hours wasted with this. How, how much of what you do uh, of natural language processing, how much of this is your work? And how much is it a uh, package, that, package that was implemented, the work that you did? I'm trying to estimate how much inefficient there is in that, in that aspect. Um, practically all public agencies face this problem and everyone is doing the same rework. So are you starting from scratch or are you able to have any collaboration with another agency or you use an existing package? How does it work? So again, since we are in a concept proof, we don't have enough time to develop things that exist from scratch. So uh, Marcus used Tesseract, which is a Python package that does this recognition. And it works relatively well. When you have the text, it's quite looks quite cute and it works well. But you have these issues of quality of the image that is uh, in there uh, and other the, the brands of the agencies things that really um, jeopardize the recognition. What we can do is to work on this recognition manually, develop something from scratch that may be better for that point that you need. But when, as we're talking about an access that comes straight from the t taxpayer, you don't have a, a standard to follow. The a uh, document of payment from the bank that is scanned or well form formatted documents that are better for the recognition uh, machine. So it's a very, very heavy process to be applied uh, in large scale, at least if you're using the Tesseract. Something more specific would have to be implemented, at least to my knowledge. PDF is not a problem. If uh, the PDF is generate, for example, you have a Word document and then you generate a PDF, and then it's not a problem. But whenever you have the images, there is a quality problem and uh, at the Court of Accounts, we have a minimum criterion to use. Tesseract is an option, but I had an experience at the beginning of the project, and I noticed that it improves the quality of the OCR that comes to us. But since we already demand the OCR, the 45% of the OCR that already come in the document, they are, they are better when you go pass it through the Tesseract. But there are many parameters that are being used within the Tesseract. And so if you change an angle, a color, uh, the quality changes. 
And so this experience is good for you to uh, change or to exchange among the, the agencies. And so when you have something ready, you have a lot that was not done in Brazil. And when it comes to the OCR, many, many things were not done in Brazil. And so most of them are made for English. And this also compromises the process a little bit. For Kat and Douglas, how do you train the doc to vect doc to vec in Portuguese. How did you deal with words that were outside the language of the doc to vec? Well, the training, we used uh, the LNTK's modules and also from Python and JSON. And so we s set the, the parameters to Portuguese. And so for the removal of the stop words, the reprocessing, the treating of the terms, everything was done with the parameters set up for Portuguese. And also Jensen. They are some libraries and they are modules of the Python. The training is represented by a vector and each tweet represents a vectorial representation that it is the concatenation of the probabilities of each term occurring in that sentence. And so the tweet is represented as a vector and all of the the tweets uh, have a vectorial space and the algorithm calculates the diff the distance between the vectors so that we can receive a notion of context the topics discussed and then you have an idea of the groups that i mentioned to you in terms of similarity an advantage that we have with the doc to vec is since it is uh, independent uh, from the the language and so some tweets you have some uh, slangs and so it incorporates all of this so we haven't faced this problem so so if uh, the person is coming from the countryside of Brazil and something that they mention in the countryside of Goiás, it's going to be able to identify this word and it's going to add this to the semantics. And so this is one of the advantages that we have when we use the doc to vec, mainly when it comes to social media. Thank you very much. I'm going to conclude this panel and let's come back at 1040. We are 10 minutes late, so we're going to diminish the coffee break in 10 minutes so that we can go back to the original program. Thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to everybody who asked questions. De processamento de linguagem natural. E convido a para o So now we would like to invite to the stage Mr. Alexandre Luiz de Biasi and identify overprices in public procurement processes through unsupervised tax clustering, developing a database for bidding processes. And so I would like to invite onto the stage Mr. Alexandre Luiz de Biasi Gandini. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alexandre Gangini. I work at the Rio Grande do Sul Court of Accounts, and I'm going to try, try to overcome my uh, nervousness. And I'm going to try to introduce this process, uh, this project to us. We have been working on it for about one year. And our main objective is identifying overpricing in public procurement processes. Maybe it seems to be something simple, but in reality, it was really complicated. So, a little bit of context first. We, the Court of Accounts, we have several, several databases and all kinds of data. We have tables, we have numeric data, we have text, we have invoices, we have a lot of text reports. 
but we have started to work uh, giving some use for these databases from the perspective of the our final work and end work objective work and also some use for our society for our society we want to give them more uh, treated data and within the projects that we are our technical department identified the project a project that would bring more benefits in the short run for the auditing departments and for our society it would be a table of prices a table of public bidding prices so how can we do that so there is no previous classification of the products, in, uh, in not in the invoices, and so we have the NCN in the invoices, and this is very generic. I need to find a way to classify each one of the products uh, bidded for and in a more precise way. And the only field that does that is the description, the, the, the text description of the product. And in the description, we can have anything. We can have uh, misspelled words, we can have numbers, we can have special characters, we can have a, a word in front of the other, but in a mistaken way, and it's really confusing. And so this is what we have to classify the products that have been purchased. And we couldn't have a classification that would encompass all of the products that the public agencies buy. This would be impossible to do. And it doesn't exist. Even if we had a classification for each specific product, we would have that the same product would have the same specifications. So, for example, medication. This is a classic example. You're going to have the same medication with many... Um, um, with different weights, 100 milligrams, 50 milligrams, 300 milligrams of each pill or capsule. And so it's very complex. The problem is very complex, much more complex than I imagined when I started working with this. And which approach did we take? So we decided to use machine learning um, and whatever you prefer to call it and also non-supervised learning. And so I wouldn't have another way of doing this. I don't have the label data. I don't know even know how many categories of products there are. So the only way of doing this that was feasible was non-supervised learning. And we consider that the, the result was very, very nice. And this process was so nice this project was so nice that I separated everything in three main areas of machine learning. We have natural language processing uh, that transforms the, 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 the text into vectors, into numbers, and so that the algorithms are going to be able to process it. There is the second part, which is reducing the dimensions. So after the vectors, you are only going to extract what's relevant, reducing by reducing their dimensions and clustering. So you're going to put items together that are similar, and you're going to separate the ones that are different. And before... So I brought some results here. And so the first product, we have a tire, 27880225. So you have a, a product that is complex. It involves numbers and, and uh, words. And so we have sentences that were written differently. And we wanted the machine to understand that everything that was here was the same thing. The same thing with soy, soybean oil, uh, cans of 900 milliliters. And so it was written differently. And in the end, we were able to cluster them and understand that they are the same product. And this is very easy for a human being to do, but not for a machine, to understand that everything is the same. And so here's another example, the same product, azitromycin, 
And sometimes it has many different specifications, and we were able to do this. What is the 500 milligrams? We have the 600 milligrams as a trauma sign, 600 milligrams, 40 milligrams, 15 milliliters, oral as a trauma scene. And so the same, sand, uh, the same product written differently. And we were able to uh, separate them by character. And so I'm going to discuss now how we did this. So in the first uh, phase, in the NLP, and so we cleared the text, we cleaned the text, and what I wanted to highlight here is that in the test that we carried out, I decided to maintain the stop words. And this is a very controversial decision. Uh, all of the work or most of the works that you're going to find with NLP, people remove the stop words. What are the stop words? They are connecting words, connectors that don't add much information when it comes to the meaning of the sentence. But here, since we are working with only the description of products, it's not a sentence. It doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's just a description. So the stop words have meaning because some products, without the stop words, the text would be uncharacterized. Uh, so sizzling water, still water. So if I remove the preposition with gas or without gas, with or without, it's going to be uh, complicated. And this was the right decision to make. And then we trained the fax, fast text model with all of the sentences so that we could have the semantic listing of these words. And there was a little problem because it's not a complete sentence, a complete phrase. It's just a description of the product. But in order for us to transform the, the sentences into dense vectors, it worked and it worked well. And we, we tested the fast text and the word to vec, but we chose the fast text because it works with similar words. And outside the vocabulary, they that were never trained uh, inside the model, and so the, the fast text was much better than the word to vec. And after that, I arrived at a dense vector with 300 dimensions. This was the size that we set for each word. So how can I transform these word vectors into sentence vectors? The description of the the product. And so we tested many, many ways of doing this, and the one that appeared to be the most effective in practice, uh, I, I, create, I calculated the weighted average or the weighted mean of the description. Why the weighted? Because I'm going to give more weight to the initial words, less weight to the last words, and I'm going to give an intermediate weight to the numbers. And this was a homemade solution. It was a homemade solution. At least we didn't find the solution. But for this specific problem, to identify products, it worked out really well. And it's logical. So the agency, when they're going to have a procurement process, they're going to describe they, they're going to describe the, the products in the first words. And to separate the products that have different characteristics, like the az azitromycin or azitromycin. And afterwards, we found a dense vector with 300 dimensions to describe each product. Carrying out some research, and in practice, I discovered that if I use the direct clustering, with these uh, vectors with 300 dimensions, the clustering algorithms would not work very well in high dimension data. So it was necessary to diminish the dimensions of the vectors. And in order to do that, the algorithm that best appeared was the U-map. 
this one I'm a big fan of you map now and I use it for many other things it works really well and I could add the distance of the cosine and this is a very good matrix to analyze the distance between the words it's non-linear it's excellent and it works really well with the clustering and I use the HDB scan, HDB scan, which is a very good uh, clustering tool. It doesn't matter the format, uh, the format of the group. It is non-linear. It does everything by density. It doesn't matter uh, how these points are. And you map and HDB scan worked out really well. And I had to inform a parameter of minimum amounts. What is the minimum uh, number of items to create a cluster? So we establish the number 30. But this parameter can go up or down. So we are working with 30 now. And then after the clustering, we exclude the outliers. And each DB scan has an item that they uh, it removes the outliers. We the similar groups were clustered together, and so based on the uh, distance of the cosine, and then we fit the 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 data that were not treated based on the cosine distance. Here are some examples of separation of clusters. No human supervised this, so this process. The machine, from the data that were in the database, it identified this, this, the patterns of the data, so it created around 10,000 categories of products. For the, the word gasoline, you have common gasoline gas, uh, or uh, additivated gasoline. For the, 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 the word peanuts, how many types of peanuts are there uh, in the world? I don't know. My algorithm uh, identified uh, um, peanuts, uh, 300 grams, uh, peeled uh, peanuts. We know that some of them are really the same thing. Uh, we, we didn't reach the point for the machine to discover this, but for now they, it created two different categories. Here are some examples of groups just to make the presentation more didactic. But until now, we are only working with text. The goal of this study is to think of price, to analyze price. How can I analyze price if, until now, the measuring units are not uh, entered uh, anywhere? So there are products that are sold in boxes, and the same product can also be sold in units or in another measuring unit. So I need to compare products of uh, the same unit, so it doesn't make sense to compare the prices. The advantage of our T TC, we have this system, we created this system called Licita.com, uh, which in which the public agencies, they send data of all the, the bidding processes, they have data from seven years, and the, there is an information of the measuring unit when, when when the um, bidding process takes place. So it, it is a good way to compare prices. Let me show you how we do the treatment of the price outliers. We order the prices from a smaller to a bigger value, only the items that has the same unit, measuring unit, and we work with the median, not the average, to have a better uh, robust, the more robust outliers, thinking of the extremes. And also, we do the cleaning process, or if the series is relatively dispersed, per se, we use the median. If it's not very dispersed, if it, ha if it, ha if it has extreme items, we take out the smaller values, and what is in, in the middle is what we use to have the me median. This system has, at first, two ways of consultation. The main one is the one in which the system will generate automatic warnings 
of overprice in the case of new uh, uh, bidding processes. Every day, new uh, bidding processes enter into the system. So what are we going to do? And it is not implemented yet. We're going to get the text of this new uh, item to, uh, that is being uh, in, the, in the bidding process. We will transform it in a vector, and we will see if this text if we have a uh, high confidence that it is one of the products that we have in our database because we did the clustering before if it is we're going to register the average price of that product in the last six months if the price if you have two deviations if it's a price that is over the the average we're going to generate uh, a warning to, to the auditors to verify in the place or to check if something is wrong there or not. Another way of consultation is an interface, and it is this one is already implemented. The auditors, through a web app, they can type the text and identify parameters of minimum and maximum uh, quantity, uh, region, and the system returns to them the um, median price based on the, gr on the groups, the clusters that we created previously. This one is already running in the courts for us to receive the feedback from uh, of the, the the rights and especially the wrongs. It is not we don't have the intention to make it 100% of rights in all cases. We we wouldn't ne we would never be able to do that. But we understand that if we make 80 to 90% of the cases, this is an excellent tool. This is going to be an excellent tool for the courts and for the society, for the public agencies for price consultation. We have, we already have great results, especially for medication, in which the system finds in most of the total uh, of the times the medication that was consulted. And of course, it works really well for recurrent uh, purchases, uh, of which we have a lot of data. For the rare procurements or specific things, it's not going to work. This is just a comment on the state of the project. It was implemented. It is a screen for the auditors of the Court of Accounts of the State of Urgandusu. They are already um, using it and making tests. And as, so, as soon as we have confidence from the feedback of the auditors, we're going to implement the warning uh, system. And it's going to be really cool because the auditor will receive uh, warnings in, in almost real time. And to the future, probably we're going to have an access uh, portal for the society, for the public agencies to check the prices of the uh, bidding processes. Here are my contacts, so you can email me or you can talk to me on LinkedIn. And I thank you so much. Well, it's very interesting to see this price detection system. Now we're going to talk to Vitor Hartz and Alexandre Vaz Hoodies for the their talk of identifying over uh, of automated identification of clerical errors in court decisions. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexandre. I'm working here with my colleague Vitor to present to you uh, the solution. We are from Federal Court of Accounts, in, uh, working in the Information and Technology Secretariat. What makes us come here was the solution that is been produced since 2018. It was a pilot in, in 2017, and it was start, it started being product, product, produced in 2018. It brought really good results, and it can be totally adaptable for any context. So we really hope to motivate uh, you somehow to apply a similar solution in your contexts. So it is the automated uh, identification of clerical errors in court decisions. So first of all, let's talk about what is material. 
or material error. These are some um, parts of ratifying agreements that are issued exclusively to correct a certain mistake that happened in another in a uh, previous uh, agreement. In this case, Mr. So-and-so had passed away before the trial uh, and he had received a fine. So you cannot fine a person that was deceased. So it is a material error. Another case here was that the name here. This uh, João Vega Leite de Albuquerque was established, but in fact, it was his son so to be um, in this agreement. So it's, an, it's another material error. Okay. So this material is all um, open source. It's all public, so uh, it's no problem to expose it. Here it is a case, uh, and the problem was the word individually that it was not in the original agreement and it should be there uh, under the penalty of in, uh, in, uh, being not exact so it could be a problem so it was another case of material error for the formal definition of material error it is an error of expression it is an evident contradiction containing the document between what the, the agreement has and what it should have. And it has to be corrected, regardless of what the text is, if it's a wrong word, it must be corrected and it, another agreement must be issued uh, correcting this mistake. In 2016, the Justice Raimundo Carreiro from, from the court uh, requested uh, an, ins an inspection in, uh, regarding these material errors. There was an increase of the occurrence of the such errors. So we started this work with the goal of uh, evaluating the incidence of material errors in the judged uh, cases, the impact in the in charging of the debt, and f to find a way to mitigate this phenomena. That was really uh, increasing in, in, our, in our institution. The results of this work show that 1,536 uh, correcting agreements were, were issued. And there was a trend of increase in the report. We could see that uh, the, this amount had doubled from one year to another. So there was a trend of increase in, in these um, uh, corrections. The process the recovery of the damage, uh, they are critical processes, and most of them were them. The main errors were in the name of the person, CPF, document number, all these mistakes were identified in this work that was carried out. To understand the impact of material error in the rework process and to justify this technological solution, I'm going to show you quickly the process, uh, procedure uh, flow in uh, the Federal Court of Accounts. So there is the, the cause and is moved to a con uh, thematic external control area and it goes through the auditors and the pronouncing of the secretary, and then it's it's referred to the cabinet of the justice responsible to that process. In that moment, there is another instruction cycle to elaborate a proposal uh, that is like the uh, document of the agreement or ruling, where this process will be um, analyzed. So the process is analyzed, and then there is the ruling or agreement and this ruling is officialized. So there is the post-judgment phase. Uh, the personnel will add the information in the system. 
and uh, pro procedural uh, communications are sent. And th this is where the material mistake is found, only at the end of the cycle, after the judgment, that this material um, error is, happens. So any material error found in this phase has to be corrected, and, it, and correcting it imp uh, implies on generating a new ruling in the cabinet of the justice and to do all this work again and then you will have the correct um, uh, procedure for, for this ruling. So the cost for returning uh, all this work process uh, due to errors that are quite evident. So they are really mistakes and they have to be corrected. The consequences of this uh, opportunity cost because the people who are uh, doing this correction could be doing other activities. The financial cost, of course, obviously. And another important one, which are damage to the image of the Federal Court of Accounts. The ruling is something that communicates. It's the communication tool from, from, the, from TCU to the society. It's how uh, TCU expresses itself, so th there is also a, a cost in terms of image of the of the Federal Court of Accounts. So the challenge was to build a solution that would identify automatically the occurrences with the potential to become errors. Uh, so I need to identify the occurrences before the ruling is officialized. Then it will not be char characterized as a material uh, error and the correction is cheaper. The solution that was proposed in the beginning was in this moment, in this point of the work process, the system that supports this movement of the work in the cabinets and the judging, when the operation of sending the uh, ruling documents to the collegiate, it goes uh, off the record, having a, a cognitive service and sends the, the content of this ruling to the cognitive work. In this cognitive uh, sense, uh, they identify the mapped occurrences. When the occurrence is identified, the cabinet of the justice who, who sent it is notified, enable him to correct it and send a new version to the collegiate. And then, Another analysis done again. If everything is all right, then it moves on in the process. And then, if not, it's notified. The person is notified, the justice, to correct this mis this error before going to the special session. So back to the technical part, I will call my, my colleague Victor. Thank you, Alexandre. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. So let's continue the presentation. I will try to go into more detail regarding the solution that was implemented, what it does, and how it gets the results. Today, the measurements that the solution does in the ruling uh, documents is the validity of numbers of documents of people and legal entities, the validity of the names of people, so the checking if the, per the person's name or the company's name is corresponding to that document number. The, the example that Alexander gave it to us, the application of fines to a deceased person, if the name of the collegiate in the text of the ruling corresponds to the, uh, to the ruling that was uh, made, and also, if it, if that uh, ruling is a, a procedure uh, term, there are uh, imprecise expressions that they they are uh, re repeatedly used. Then the auditors use them uh, recently. Uh, monetary uh, values expressed in uh, in numbers and the, the writing of this uh, amount in parentheses. So there are some verifications that speed up the, the work of the human revisor. So we uh, increase the verifications that are done throughout the time. And we intend 
to include new verifications of other uh, material errors that are uh, less frequent, but they can that it can be found automatically, and we can increase the impact of our solution. So how does this solution work? It illustrates in a simplified way how we reached our our goal. Well, let me explain. First of all, the input, the JSON containing the integrated text of the ruling and parameters such as collegiate, if that ruling is associated to um, um, resource, and also checking the map. It comes, this, this ruling comes from another system that supports the procedure movement from the cabinet of the relating justice. So when when this uh, document of of it, of the ruling is sent, we can find the, the uh, material errors. There was a, a code written in Python that does the processing, and we use framework web Flast to do some open inscriptions, and we have another version with fr framework Django that presented some advantages, and we might uh, substitute it in, in the near future. So, important things that this Python um, code does is the processing of natural language, uh, the NLP. With the text of this ruling, we can extract information using NLP to, to this uh, for this purpose. One of them is the use of uh, traditional rules with uh, regular uh, expressions. For example, the number of documents. And also we, we use the machine learning. So the, the solution of material errors has used these two approaches to solve different problems. For example, in terms of machine learning with recurrent networks and neural uh, networks to determine if the text of the ruling has an application of a fine to a certain person. But currently, and it is a dynamic process, we have uh, substituted in this process of uh, fine application the model of machine learning uh, substituted by the, this um, solution uh, based in rules and uh, regular expressions and we reduce the time of response of the system. So it, it is interesting. It is a dynamic process and I believe that in the future we will be able to use machine learning models to use more complex models and to give more flexibility to the solution. So via the NLP we extracted data from the ruling like names, CPF number, and so the uh, the fines and sanctions applied and our python also gets information from external data so the name the cpf number and the fines and sanctions applied we get this from the irs services and also deaths so there if there was a fine applied to the person liable and it shows to us that that person is deceased then they are material errors so our Python code works with three kinds of uh, information, three kinds of pieces of information, and there is a cross-referencing. Cross we have the data, the metadata, and also external data. And the output of the system is also JSON, and so the report of errors detected. If there are no errors, nothing happens. But if there are errors, the report is sent via email, as Alexandre mentioned, to the cabinet so that they can be corrected. And we also have reports for the auditing of the systems, tests and failures report. And so to increase the impact of this solution more and more, we are including and we're going to continue including new kinds of material errors in the detection of the system. And another thing that we should do is to make this service available at other moments of the procedural process. And so up until that time, the system worked as Alexandre mentioned. So they sent the minutes of the ruling to the collegiate. But we already have a project that is being developed to make the services available at other moments. 
and so in the technical department or maybe the auditor creating the minutes of the report or it can be a secretary to use the solution so that in an anticipated way they can avoid material errors and also at the rapporteur's cabinet and we also have the post ruling or post judging maybe there were material errors information added later on and now we have a pilot project to use the solution uh, during the post judgment post trial phase and so we can do this uh, underneath everything or any user can use it and enjoy the the options of the solution so now we have an interface for the user and this interface can be used in three different ways first you can upload the ruling or you can only copy and paste the ruling and the third way which is for the post trial phase is to research a set of rulings and all of the rulings published they have already been previously analyzed by the the material error code in the case of the set of rulings you have a screen such as this the number of errors the verifications done and they also show the results if it's green is that there were no material errors red there were material errors and yellow something happened and the execution was not completed and so you can determine a certain ruling and then you can analyze a ruling and individually and there is a screen such as this making a list of the material errors found by the system and you can also analyze the validations during the testing phase which were the tests carried out were there any failures and so to illustrate the results that we have when using the system we um, compiled data from last month so among about 2600 rulings 47 notifications were given to us about material errors so the, many of these errors were avoided by the system 21 related to the person's name 16 uh, undue uh, actions uh, three for the collegiate and seven and so the users of the system and the services within the the court that are responsible for revising the rule rulings and avoid the material errors they have been giving us extremely positive feedback and so they are now counting on the system and some material errors that were extremely common the cpf number the name they don't go through this system any longer they are corrected by the system and so so the impact of the system is extremely positive and it's huge for the court and to illustrate this we have some statistics that that are very simple so during the period of time that we were assessed between 2013 and 2015 we had about 500 rectifying rulings a year and so uh, the tendency was to increase and in 2019 I believe we're only gonna have 50 rectifying rulings and so uh, there was a reduction of approximately 90 percent and we hope that we're not going to correct a 100 percent but we're going to implement new corrections and verifications and we hope to diminish this m number even more and to wrap up i would like to discuss something alexandre mentioned and i uh, hope that my presentation has made this clear so with a simple simple solution based on the uh, tools we use it can have a huge impact a huge impact for the court and i believe that every court and every public agency they have official documents in which the presence of material uh, errors and mistakes it can be very costly for that agency and so you need human beings to do that you need human resources and it becomes even costlier so to avoid this kind of cost this solution is uh, highly replicable and i hope to have shared this with you that similar solutions can be developed with uh, significant impacts thank you very much
And here is my personal uh, information and personal contacts. Now, Rafael Castillo de Sá, from the National Cinema Agency, and his presentation is going to be Box Office Predictive Analysis Based on Movie Script Assessments. Mr. Rafael Castillo Correia de Sá, from the Brazilian Cinema Agency. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rafael. I'm the manager of IT at the Brazilian Cinema Agency, and I'm going to talk about my uh, master's uh, thesis, master's dissertation, and, uh, and the topic of my the thesis was the box office prediction based on the movie script. And so here I have an observation. So this is a, a master's thesis. And so these are my opinions here. And so what am I going to discuss with you this morning? I'm going to talk a little bit about the methodology I used, the contextualization of the business and the definition of the problem, the data sources, the techniques and tools used, the development of the model itself, and the results obtained. So the methodology used is an industrial methodology, which is the CRISP-DM. It's a data mining tool, and it is a standard in the market. And it uses machine learning. It's subdivided into six phases. So you have understanding the problem, and then you have understanding the data, preparing the data, the modeling, and then the assessment, and then the implementation of this in the productive sector. To contextualize a little bit, it's a market that I believe not all of you are familiarized with. So the cinema market around the world uh, had a revenue of 41.1 billion reais in 2008. Brazil is the 14th market when it comes to the number of movies uh, released, and Brazil is the eighth. Brazil is the eighth market in terms of the number of tickets sold. And so the the gross uh, revenue was about 2.45 billion and 290 million uh, uh, are regarding Brazilian movies, and uh, 185 Brazilian movies were released in 2018, and the audience of the movies in 2018 uh, was of about 163 million and 500,000 people, and 20, around 24 million of these uh, members of the audience were watching Brazilian movies. Okay, and what are the characteristics of the movie industry? And so the profits of the producers are concentrated in a small number of films that were very successful. Only 6% of the films represent 80% of the profit of the movie industry in the last decade. Yeah. And there is a selection process that is still uh, uh, offers low assertivity, and we need uh, specialized uh, human resources, and the investments are represent high risk. And so here I have two movies, one movie about superheroes created by Disney, and one is uh, on the positive side. It has the highest box office of the history of the movies, it had uh, a revenue of 356 million. No, was the budget. And it, the revenue was $2 billion, and the budget estimated was 356 million. And so, for the same studio, the second movie, X Men, The Black Phoenix, represented a loss for Disney of $170 million. Is it possible for you to forecast the success or not of a movie? And so, how can you do this forecasting? 
And that's why I investigated this problem during my master's thesis. And throughout my research, uh, what I could identify is that we used the, the largest number of variables to analyze this problem. And then I decided to analyze what was the selection process of the agency, of the Brazilian cinema agency? And I decided to get one, which was the analysis of the movie scripts. And so currently, in one of the funding lines, the movie script is uh, analyzed by two external consultants. And so this costs 593 reais per project. And so we hand uh, a batch with seven scripts, and then they have two weeks to deliver the analysis to us. And then we have the addition of the scores, and then we make a decision regarding the selection using other additional criteria. So why analyze the movie script? Well, the script works as if uh, it, it were a flow chart or uh, a scheme of the movie, everything that is necessary to make that movie. So it's a very rich source of uh, data. It identifies all of the scenes, the environments, the actions. It identifies the characters, the dialogues, and the scripts that follow the international standards. It's one page of sc the script represents one minute of the movie. So from the text in the script, you can uh, determine what is going to be the duration of that movie. Another important characteristic is that in general, they have three acts. So the introduction or the presentation, and then there is a conflict in the narration, and then the solution of the problem and the closing of the movie. And so the long movies, they have between 100 and 120 pages, the long duration movies. And so I wanted to work with the scripts, and I had to go after the scripts. And then I came across a uh, uh, so uh, finding this information. And so you have many websites with the information. And a decision that I had to make with my project is, since I didn't find scripts in Portuguese, the source of the information was very scarce. And I had to work with scripts in English. And so I basically use. Uh, web scrapping technique so that I could scrap many, many scripts websites to use these scripts as a source of data for my project. But since the problem we are discussing is the classification, forecasting of how successful a movie is going to be, what the box office is going to be, so I also needed, for example, to see the performance these movies had at the box office. And so there is a website that has a lot of information. And so I had information since 1995. And so uh, the name of this website is The Numbers. So I got information from 1995 to 2017, the gross values and the number of tickets sold. And to do the web scrapping, I used several tools, several Python libraries. And you can see this on the slide. They are well-known libraries if you work with data science. And so we have pandas and beautiful soup that I used to analyze the, the text that were in the HTLM pages. HTLM, HTLM, I had TXT, I had PDF, I had the PDF that couldn't uh, go through the OCR, so I had to get the information so that I could model this, I could model this. And then 
as many of the other speakers mentioned, how can I transform the text into something that the machine can interpret? And how can I work with these texts using machine learning? In order to do that, I use a set of techniques called word embeddings, word embeddings. And there is a quote by John Firth that says, if you know a word, you you know a word by the words that uh, accompany it. And this is a free translation of a quote by John Firth. And so word embeddings try to represent words that are similar with a vectorial representation that is also similar. And so the word embedding techniques transform a text into a, a low density vector because the techniques used previously they they generated sparse matrices with huge dimensions and this was very difficult for the processing but the most modern techniques of word embedding they have smaller vectors and for my thesis i worked with vectors with 100 from 100 to 30 300 dimensions and another interesting information is that you can use several embeddings that are made available by other researchers and companies and you can train them and the body of the text can be used so that you can apply to your field of knowledge and so what were the embedding uh, models applied in my project so i use word to vec which is a google model one of the first created of word embeddings the glove that was a model created by stanford and also the fast text so the word to vex uses neural connections to try to forecast a continuous bag of words and the skip gram from a context of a word going back a little bit so if you have in a sentence let's let's imagine that you have in a sentence five words and you choose a word in the center you're going to determine the context of this word if the context is equal to four it's going to get the two words before it and the two words after it and then it's going to for predict the word in between in the glove the technique is very different it goes from the co occurrence of the words and it analyzes the probability of these words occurring in the same context so that it can predict the vectorial uh, representation of these words on this slide i decided to share practical examples with you examples that i got with fast text and uh, with this uh, uh, word embedding model i get i got the best results and you can see very clearly so if you have the word Asgard, the model is going to bring uh, the neighbors, warriors, battlefields, vil villainous. So if you have Wolverine, and then it's going to show you hypodermic, hydraulic, skeletal. And so in fact, the model is able to understand the semantics of these words in a very effective way. Another example. Yeah, another example is the case of Frodo or Gandalf and Aragorn. If you know the movies of The Lord of the Rings, you know that the semantics was well captured. Here, about to the concrete uh, situation, to the effective situation, as we already had the words transformed in vectors, how did we do the transformation of documents? Well, as in a screenplay, I had different uh, words and I used the multiplication of the TFDF metrics for the embeddings that I had for any for other words. I could obtain the embedding of a whole screenplay. Here we have some screens to to show what are these embeddings, these vectorial representations that we all mentioned in, in the in the previous presentations, and how these values are put. In fact, you can see they are 
real values and for each line for example in this matrix we have a screenplay and each word of the screenplay with their representation in a dimensional space at the end what I had was a matrix with 1148 1, lines and 300 columns each 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 matrix is a screenplay of a movie and the transcriptions is the embeddings output in the, of the embedding models here I bring the bidimensional representation of the screenplays after applying fast text in the uh, 300 dimension uh, representation using the technique of TSNE and the dimensionality reduction to present the model in two dimensions we have this representation in which the screenplays in orange are the ones that originally were classified as a failure and the purple ones are the ones that were successful here I present to you the obtained results to predict the ticket box to predict the box office in a binary variable the definition of success in the case of gross uh, revenue for the movies that had above 65 million dollars this matrix was taken from the literature using the it's a research uh, field that has many um, studies so I could explore that from other studies the model that had the best performance was the support vector machine using the embeddings of fast text of 300 dimensions it presented an F1 of 77 the second best model was a neural network of 1.75 and the congressional network was this third one with 0.71 It's interesting to observe how the volume of data that I had in the beginning of the project was reduced. The con congressional networks didn't have a very good uh, performance and it lost, lost for the neural uh, networks and the, the other models. Here you can see the confusion matrix of the best mode models the number of false positives was low just two screenplays were considered to be successful when they were in fact failures it is important in the moment in the model of investment uh, context so it can uh, release um, investment to something that will not generate a return and the support of vector machine that br brought the best development and the best performance when we consider the success as a total number of tickets sold to a certain movie the success uh, goal was considered 10 million tickets sold and the best model is the neural network with the F1 of 75 the option f for this F1 as, as others mentioned in the previous uh, talks was 70% of the movies having a failure being failures and 30% of them being successes so it was important to use a matrix that was re robust to the unbalancing of the data set here again we have the confusion matrix it increased a little bit the number of false positives and the configuration of the of the neural network between the different layers so what were the outcomes that we obtained the best model the best binary model was support vector machine of f1 score of 0 77 and precision of 0 80 in total the neural uh, networks presented the best performance although the support vector machine at the end was uh, the best model and the convolutional networks although in the literature they have a very positive result in the task of textual classification they didn't present positive results in this project 
as I mentioned, the volume of data was really low, and the result is aligned to to the expected. I, I estimated the cost of uh, 0.62 centavos of uh, Brazilian reais, and and it was done by a press list of Windows P2 list in in WS. And the time of analysis of a, of a screenplay was 30 seconds in the classification of that uh, screenplay. Uh, regarding the improvements for future works was to analyze the use of additional variables because in the first moment I wanted to concentrate on the capacity of the model to identify automatically from the text relevant information and I didn't add any other variable but it would be interesting for next for in future analysis also to explore different strategies to for the treatment of words out of the vocabulary if i could use a strategy that would would be more robust the results would be improved and then use more modern embedding uh models 2018 was a very uh, a typical uh, year for uh, embedding uh, techniques such as uh, techniques such as BERT or ELMO would be would have brought better results. In the context of my work itself, I build a data, data bank of screenplays to in Portuguese to be explored in the Brazilian context. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Now I'm, I'd like to invite for the last presentation of this panel Luis Brito from CEPRO to present the petition assistant for the Federal Public Defense Office. Good morning, everyone. My name is Luis Brito. I am an analyst of CEPRO, and today I'm here to present the project uh, uh, assistance, uh, petition assistance for the Federal Public Defense Office. CEPRO has uh, developed this project along with the Defense Office since March this year, the Federal Public Defense DCU, DPU. I will present the needs that we identified at at uh, DPU, which is the Defense's Office, that uh, brought to life this uh, petition's assistance. Then I will talk about the project, how this assistance uh, will work when it's available to use, not yet. And then I will show you how, in, how in, we are going to apply the natural language processing in this work. In the setting of the um, defensor's office, the petitions are very important, the initial petitions. These documents are the ones that start the legal process uh, along with the, co the cause. So in many times when a citizen um, searches for the Federal Public Defense's office, it becomes an assistance and a petition will be uh, made for this cause to be started. This activity demands a lot of uh, attention from the the ones that issue it because it's very important. But most part of the requests for these petitions are recurrent. They are repetitive, such as concession for uh, illness uh, aid, for example. They The, the situations that compose a petition, they uh, meet these demands. We would say that, at least partially, this activity is quite repetitive because in practice, when the public defender or his assistants will make this petition for the recurrent demands, they search in their petition uh, repository they have for petition that have met a similar demand 
of a similar case and they extract the text from that uh, petition and they uh, get the information from the new petition and they do the, the adjustment. So uh, this system works as a robot. So it is an activity that does not demand a lot from the uh, intellectual capacity of, of the systems of the public defense. And this activity has a great, uh, represents a great volume of work to the, to the cabinet because most of the petitions are this type. So it takes, it's really a time consuming activity. So uh, within this context, we identified some needs that could be met by the um, auto automatic assistant. For example, to increase the in, uh, capacity of writing of petitions in the cabinets, uh, which are the offices where these petitions are written. So once these activities are repetitive, if we can automate them partially, we could increase this capacity of com of writing of the petitions and accelerate the workflow of the defense's office uh, as a whole to help the assistance to the citizens. Another need would be to provide more time for the public defenders to dedicate themselves to other activities, such as, for example, to write um, petitions to demands that are not as uh, repetitive and of course they are more complex so that would demand the defensors to write a new uh, text text that are, are different different from what is common to their everyday work so the petitioning assistant of the defensor's office it is an, a, a, mod, a module that is integrated to the um, Federal Public Defense's Office. The system is kept and evolved by CEPRO, uh, the place where I work. And currently, we are in the moment of uh, uh, creation, designing of the project. We already had a positive uh, signing from the general uh, defense's officer. So we are internally uh, developing this uh, solution to be um, implemented very soon. When it is available in their initial version, they will be able to provide to the public defensors initial petitions containing all the essential elements to this document, including the legal uh, fundamentals that would be uh, suggested according to the, the text that the defensor has to establish in that petition. It is a goal that we need to to reach when we uh, deliver the first version of this assistance. So to use this tool, we need we foresee some um, uh, deliver deliverables in the in the short time. How this assistance is going to work? We're going to start from the initial petitions. There are text documents in formats ODT, uh, doc or docx, which are uh, kept in the repository of the, uh, the defender's office. They are text documents, so in the last level, the, all the text uh, has paragraphs and words, so they, they don't have any type of structuring that could allow us identify automatically the sessions, the intention, and the dis discussed case. So these elements are very important to fundamentally the work of the assistants. The session are the parts of the petition. We have the um, introduction, assisted qualification. Our intention is the uh, mandatory element of the petition that declares the object of that petition. For example, the establishment of uh, sickness, aid, um, benefits. And the arguments proposed in that petition to prove that that uh, document is really uh, valid. So the writer I'm, I'm, and uh, the, the request requesting person is really legible for the, of that benefit. From these petitions, we generate what we call session samples. They, they are uh, excerpts of text that they are labeled uh, in categories of sections and subsections. We have examples of categories, for example, introduction, 
qualification of the assisted person, qualification of the uh, the other parts of this petition, and we can have other categories. For example, the intention. We have a concession of uh, illness aid benefit uh, or retirement uh, conversion. So normally a petition can have more than one intention. Another category that we can use in the samples are the discussed um, thesis or texts, like the incapacity of the requ requesting person. So we have some of these categories. In practice, what we do in this moment is to extract the samples of the petition and do the labeling, as we can see in this picture. This work demands the implementation of the supervised learning um, techniques. Once we could label these samples with section uh, categories, we can extract the structure of the petition. So it is a sequence of sections and subsections identified in a petition. We can have the, as the first session the introduction, and then the next one is the qualification of the, the requesting person, and so on. When we analyze it, when we put a, a magnifying glass in the different structures of petitions, we can structure what we call semantic network. The semantic network helps to explain all the concepts, all the information that exists in a general way in the initial petitions, which are made by a specific topic, for example, the uh, illness aid benefit. We use this principle to explain to the client, to the defender's office, how the information of the initial petition were written by the public defenders and their and in their assistance. Looking at the semantic network, we could find better uh, labels for the categories of, of sessions. We could group some categories. We could generate subcategories. It was really interesting to use this resource. After that, we go to the session models. They are excerpts of generic text. They are parametrized. And, re and they receive attributes. We use the session models to apply the models in the creation of a new initial petition. The session models can be generated based on the samples of sessions that we extracted and labeled previously. We propose it to be done by artificial intelligence and human intelligence. In the practice, what we're going to do is to apply a group, a text group, a grouping uh, technique in the session samples, for example, the introduction session, and present these groups of samples to the user so that the user can extract from there a generic s pattern that can be applied in other petitions. The same way we try, we intend that this is going to be done via AI so that we can use some technique to generate natural language. And so these uh, section models, they also need to receive a label uh, with the categories of section, subsection, and they can be labeled based on different kinds of categories, the intention, the thesis being discussed. And so when we conclude everything, we go to the main nucleus that would be the creation of a new petition. And so it is subdivided into many phases. The first one is obtaining information on the lawsuit. And so there is an origin of the lawsuit that is uh, registered in the CIS uh, CGU. And then we get to the phases of the process. And so we have the data of the documents, information of the, the narrative, assisted data, assisted data, the the reports, the data in the reports. And so based on this information and these data, we are going to forecast or predict the 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 intention categories, the uh, thesis being discussed. 
and maybe we can add it to a new petition. And we're also going to predict the best structure of the new petition. Even though most of the petitions, they have a basic structure, a standard structure, there is a subtle difference between the structures depending on the public defender, the public defender. And so the idea is that the machine is going to learn the best standard, the best parameter, and is going to suggest the best structure. For example, for a new case, a new data, a new piece of data, once we have the structure, we need to fill it in with the section models that are the best. And then we're going to get the best section model uh, regarding that new structure. We're going to get the best uh, section model, and we're going to compare it to the new structure. And they are they are param par parametrized. There are some empty fields that need to be filled in. And once again, we're going to use information that we got in the first phase. And so when we conclude the new petition, it's going to be presented to the public defender, and it's going to be able to complement the content. And besides Besides reviewing the work done by the AI, he's going to have the possibility of teaching the AI in a very comprehensive way to create new petitions in the future so that we can re retrofeed the assistant. And so each revision and review is going to generate better work. So to summarize how the things work, we have this flow chart. We start from the initial petitions. The initial petitions are processed. And then we extract uh, the samples of sections. These uh, samples of sections are labeled. After that, we have structures of the petitions. And then we can create section models, which uh, can be parametrized and to conclude we are going to create a new petition and then we're going to collect all of the elements that we're going to have but where are we going to use a uh, natural language here NLP so initially when we are labeling the section samples we're going to uh, apply NLP regarding the labeling, the intention, the thesis. And so we're going to have supervised learning using texts. And so when we generate the section sample, we're going to use NLP so that we can cluster the, the samples based on the text, uh, based on the non-supervised uh, uh, learning. We we are going to try to identify what is going to be the best technique in each one of these tasks because the techniques, they are sensitive to the context that we intend to apply. And within this nucleus for the generation of models, we're going to use NLP to generate section models based on these section samples. And we're going to generate natural language. And from my perspective, this is the biggest challenge we're going to have in this project. We have been studying ways of doing this, some techniques that uh, can generate good uh, results and outcome. And to wrap up, uh, we are going to use the natural language processing uh, to classify the processes, the agreement processes. So some of these data, they are text. And so we're going to have to use NLP to extract information and to classify the agreement processes. The same way, we're going to recommend the structure of a new petition. And we're also going to have to use the NLP. And in an analogous way, we're also going to use NLP in the recommendation of the section models used in the new petition. To wrap up, I would like to thank your attention. Thank you for your attention. I would also like to thank the uh, the Public Pro Defender's Office. And I'm going to leave here my, my Public Defender's Office. And if you are in doubt about anything, if you have questions, send me an email, get in touch with me. And I'm also going to be here during the Q&A session. Thank you very much.
So I would like to invite all of the speakers onto the stage, please, so that we can have the Q&A session. So uh, it was very interesting, the contact of these presentations, lots of information about NLP, and we have received some questions here. So I'm going to start. Uh, there is a question asked by Julia Pobel. So, whenever you are advertising a movie, uh, is it going to impact the box office uh, based on the, the estimate of the revenues that you mentioned? Well, yes. In fact, Throughout my research, what I could notice is that, in fact, there were uh, researches with different focus on the production chain and also the development of the movie. In my case, I focused uh, on the beginning of this production chain before the movie is being produced, when it is being selected, which movies a company is going to produce or not. So it's a moment that we called green lighting or green lights when the movie receives the green light to be produced. And also it is possible for you to uh, work uh, on different points of the production chain. But in terms of investment, the heaviest investment is done when the movie is being produced. And so that's why I focused on this part of the production chain, what would be the anticipation to the exposure of the risk that would be higher. A question from Luzia Dourado to our friend from Serpro, Luiz Brito. Is it possible, it's possible for the petitions to have many natures and purposes. So what was the criteria that you used to have uh, a lot of data? So when I started the project, we had carried out some POCs, POCs, and our coordinator there said to us that the topic that is most discussed would be the the health care petitions. And so we focused on this. It was a guidance that we received. We didn't have any other technical uh, analysis to determine this topic. Another question for Rafael. So, uh, predicting the return on investment, the ROI, is important for the movie industry. Did you analyze the model, uh, taking this into consideration? No, I didn't verify this. There were several models that worked with this, but it was difficult for me to collect all the data uh, because of the time that I had for me. But I, th I understand that uh, from a business perspective, it would be much better uh, than the gross revenues. So it can have success in the box office, but then maybe the production cost was higher too. And so I know that it was a more precise technique. A comment more than a question for Victor and Alexandre Roriz. Marcelus recommends that the work could have used the CERC to uh, receive information about about deceased people. So did you choose the RFD instead of the CERC? So the database that we used was Sysobi. It was a system that, to, uh, that uh, sets the number of deaths. This was the system that we used, but that is a good question, and it is a good remark. Maybe I'm going to use it. So as regards this part, I didn't know this database. I had no idea it is existed, but for sure I'm going to take into consideration for the future. And 
A uh, question to Alexandre. What tech identif uh, what identification and, and treatment of anomalies technique was used, and was there a comparison of uh, comparison to other machine learning models? Yes. This question regarding the, the the performance of the model is a little jeopardized because the clustering, the part of the clustering of the text to find the categories of products is not is non supervised. So I don't have at the end of the process a metric to see how good it is unless humans verify this manually. So we are doing this. We have run uh, countless tests and the team who works with this identified visually running simulations that the model is in an acceptable level. So now we open to other people uh, uh, provide some feedback on it. And regarding the models uh, that we use, yes, if we use other models, yes, we use many numbers of uh, uh, models, combinations of word embeddings, the weights, the way of transforming, the amount of dimensions. And this was the one that presented the best outcome. Again, if the since the process is not supervised, I don't have uh, a way to measure how good this process was. Now a question regarding the performance. Let's see how you can position yourself on it. What was the uh, mistake in terms of percentage and highs? What is the scope? All products or are, are services? The words, were they uh, defined manually? or were they machine learned? All right, let's start from the last question. For now, we are working only with uh, procurements done by public agencies. Why is that? We have the database of the uh, invoices of procurements done by uh, public agencies. And at some point, we're going to have the basis of invoices of uh, agencies that buy from uh, private companies. But I don't have the unit, the measuring unit in the invoices. And there's another complicator. You're going to have the commercial names of the product. In the description of the bidding processes, the text is much more, much cleaner. So we don't have the intention to attack to do this comparison if the public price is, is higher than or lower than the private price. The next question regarding the performance of the models, of the errors. I'm not here trying to predict anything. I'm, I just want to know the price that effectively happened in that product category. So I have that in my base of bidding processes, the prices that were effectively carried out, that were authorized, and the products that were pr purchased. When there is another bidding, I compare the price, if it's lower or higher. For now, we are using uh, standard deviations, and I will consider that as a sub-price. I don't have this question of... Uh, um, average uh, mistake. Yeah, what about the other products and services? No. I tried at all costs to include the services, but the services seem, at least in the database that I have, the database of bidding processes, each service is very uh, specific. Even if it's a standard uh, service such as um, food or cleaning, they have specificities that, that they don't allow me to do the clustering. So the system is working very well for procurement in general, for products, for equipment, consumption material, but I, we could not do the same for services. You said that you don't have a, a, an error matrix that is really clear, but can you inform along with the prediction of overpricing or not, a level, a level of uh, confidence regarding the existence of price. 
the similarity to the text? Yes. You compare the new text with the groups that I have, and I see the one that has the great greatest similarity of cosine. What I can interpret as being the level of certainty that that text is really the product I'm searching. So the level of confidence of text, yes, and I use it as a minimum parameter to know if that product is really that thing. If the text is written in a different way or a new product that the, that is not present in the, in the base, it will provide a low similarity. And of course, I will not point that. I will not put it in in any in any category. Now, the level of certainty regarding the price, no. For now, I'm just working in the methodology of the standard deviation. For the colleagues Victor and Horis, how general is the solution of material error? Would it be adaptable in other uh, agencies? You published the, this project uh, viewing the use it for third parties. The general approach of the solution is highly replicable and usable in other settings. As far as I know, there, there is no publication regarding the code, and in my opinion, for now, the code is really specific. Um, at the same time that the approaches are general, but the specific solutions are really towards the problems that are specific of the rulings of TCU based on interactions with the clients that use the system. So I don't know if the specific functions that make the verifications that I mentioned in the presentation would be exactly adaptable to other contexts. But I think that with the constant evolution of the system, we are will be able, I imagine that we, we will be able to have a solution, a code, that is more generalizable, and in the future it could be possible to publish and share it in a in a productive way in other contexts, in other to other agencies. We try to bring the idea um, uh, first of, uh, above all. The technical part is in. Um, uh, not very complex, technically speaking, compared to other uh, works that was, uh, were shown here. Our, our idea is to motivate people to adopt something similar to what we did. The material errors detection system is good enough to uh, detect use uh, the mistakes of users. For example, you could increase an increase of detection prior to the publication, so we could suggest the users that are not uh, that are so reliable in the, in the in the in your system that they would they wouldn't be so thorough in their revisions well this exact exact number is an, a hypothesis that is good to validate but we know that the confidence is very high in the system all the, the cabinets that we that are applying in the system uh, they are really impressed with the, the results, and uh, we need to validate this hypothesis. There are some testimonials that show uh, a decrease of the occurrence of certain errors, and they receive the error notification. So it is a learning, and there is an improvement. So it is a supervised application. So we've had this feedback, and also uh, after the trial, like this CPF and, and uh, numbers, for example. So, uh, in general, uh, they are really happy with, with the, the, the solution. And we, of course, we are going to implement new rules. So, I think that people are really excited with, with this tool. Thank you. To Rafael from Ancini. The use of predi pre productive, uh, predictive models in the office boxes are interesting. Uh, and how do you find the success in forms that are not tested? 
I believe that it is a risk from the moment that we employ only the algorithm to classify and select the movies it could bring a more a better homogeneity in the works selected however what I could observe is that in fact among the uh, cinema um, works observed there is a large heterogeneity so I don't see at the moment as a possibility for for the algorithm to bring a certain bias or a tendency for the movies to be the selected movies to be from a specific group the original uh, dispersion is heterogeneous so in, on the side of success and on the side of uh, failure the example that I brought to you shows it clearly we're talking about two movies from the same company the same producers but in a specific case which is the, the X-Men Phoenix uh, presented a, a really big um, loss financial loss you, you showed a, a model that generates um, uh, uh, screenplays no I didn't have any model that generates screenplays it was not even in the scope of my work not even to, to the future the focus of the work is to understand if it's possible um, with information within the screenplay as a human person that could read the, the screenplay and find uh, interesting uh, characteristics if the machine could do the same reading and infer characteristics that could lead to determination of that movie to be a success or failure regarding this why uh, did you focus on a binary thing success or failure and uh, or instead of other points associated so the is the performance uniform uh, so is it very depending on the study and what did you do in terms of exploratory uh, uh, data for example the the characters the the dialogues so in terms of exploratory analysis I didn't do a huge uh, exploratory analysis so I don't have all of these data and so how is the distribution uh, based on gender number of actors and actresses I didn't do that and what were the other things so is the, the performance of your model uniform so is it um, no I didn't do the stratification of the results so I don't have this kind of data and so if I would have a higher concentration what I could notice in the literature in general is that the nonfiction movies they have a higher box office than the others but I didn't uh, separate it uh, by stratification I didn't do the stratification and so why is uh, the variable binary only so in terms of tasks I had a reduced volume of data and so the perception that I had is that if I try to do this continuously to try to get it right to try to get the absolute value of the box office I would not be able to get an efficient algorithm an efficient model that's why I chose a model well we also tested multi-class models and as I mentioned before in the end the multi-class models performance were really really worse the the best one had an F1 of 0.45 against 0.70 of the SVL and so uh, if I had more data to work on maybe I would really try another model but within the project since the volume of data was extremely reduced so I chose the binary model and multi uh, over the multi-class 
even though you are a civil servant of Ancini, you couldn't have access to the models already analyzed by Ancini, the Brazilian movie agency. Well, during my project, I, I stayed uh, out of uh, my office because I was there during my master's, and I tried not to use the data that Ancini had. And regardless of this, I know that we don't have a structured database of models, and so they are not structured in a single database. And so that was the issue. Since I was far from the office to do my master's, I used external data. There is a question for the gentleman from SERPRA. Do you know any program that uses a program that uses a language that is an older language and that uh, creates documents? No, I don't know. I don't know. So it's a little older. No, no, I don't know it. But if we have good documents, so the person who asked this, please send it to me. And uh, it's always good for me to get to know new technologies that are old technologies. So in the petition via the assistant, did you uh, think about including metadata created by the courts? Yes. So in the future, in the future versions, we want to be able to measure the success rate of the petitions that were created by the assistant via the metadata. But the CGS GPU does not have connection with the other courts, and so we wouldn't be able to think about this. Serpru has just in, uh, inherited this uh, system. We received it in July of this year. And the biggest demand we have regarding it is to create integration. So once we integrate everything and we can have access to the data, we're going to use all of these data to enrich the analysis, the learning that we're going to have in the assistant to choose the best models, the best structures. And there is a suggestion. So it, when the system is working, Please don't only export the written petition, but export the written petition and the data set, the, stru the set of structured data, so that all of the agencies, all of the courts involved in the judicial chain, and so sometimes they import the raw data in text and then they do everything. So if you can share among us the structured data of the previous analysis, this would make our lives much, much easier. So the idea is to maintain this, uh, the petition totally structured. And so when we have this with the courts, most of the courts, they already have the, the capacity to do this electronically. So maybe we are not even going to have text documents any longer. We're going to have an e-interface. So this is a protocol that the courts used to do this. And so the last questions for the court of accounts. So do you need to have curatorship regarding this to have an effective solution? Or are you going to have an automatic correction of the failures? Uh, to uh, to my knowledge, and so the clients, they collected the information, and this was excellent, and they got it from the code. No, there was no training course. So, yes, I believe we would need to talk to the curator to see if new expressions arose, uh, undo expressions. This is for identifying new undo uh, expressions. What about for the correction? And so, no, it doesn't uh, carry out the correction, right? No. Given the time, I believe we should wrap up. Thank you so much to the speakers. We are going to conclude this uh, panel, and let's start at 2.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. And remember that the, uh, we're going to have food trucks here at the main entrance of the Court of Accounts. Thank you.